that's great. It's really wonderful to see that uh, on the chat function. I encourage people to continue as you log on. So thank you and, and good morning. My name is Uva Brandis. I'm professor of practice and the faculty director of the Georgetown Global Cities Initiative at, at, at Georgetown University. And I'd like to welcome everyone to this very special event entitled 20 Years of Comprehensive Planning in the District of Columbia. The Global Cities Initiative at Georgetown is, is a university-wide community of faculty and students which span all schools and research centers to come together and explore interdisciplinary ideas related to cities and the processes associated with global uh, unprecedented urbanization. It'd be impossible for us to advance this dialogue without an express attention to, to our own community, um, the city of Washington and the extended national capital region. We are honored today to host a very special dialogue, one that is at once related to the at times arcane professional practices of urban planning, but also based on foundational questions about how we position our city, how we position our neighborhoods and our communities to embrace the future. Next slide, please. Uh, it is my privilege to welcome our guests today. <clears throat> uh, to my knowledge, this is the very first time all five of the most recent Washington DC planning directors have ever been convened together. I would like to welcome, uh, in order of their service, Andrew Altman, Ellen McCarthy, Harriet Tregoning, Eric Shaw, and current director, Andrew Trueblood. Each of these very highly accomplished individuals would ordinarily command a five to 10 minute long introduction each and in order to streamline our time together today, we've posted their biographies on the event page at globalcities.georgetown.edu. I'm also delighted to welcome Don Edwards, adjunct faculty member in the Georgetown Urban and Regional Planning Program. And Don will be moderating the dialogue today and in some ways, Don represents a common thread at this event, having engaged each of the individual directors over the last 20 years in his professional capacity as a specialist in community facilitation and conflict resolution. Before we move on, I'd like to extend a very, very special thank you to Anita Kozart and to the DC Office of Planning. Without Anita's partnership, <clears throat> this program would not have been possible and I'd also like to thank Enrique Pelez and Robert Cooper for their assistance in planning and administrating this event. Uh, next slide, please. Washington DC is in many ways similar to so many other cities across the country. And in many ways, it's much different than others. While there are many insights that we'll be discussing today, the last 20 years represent a startling reversal of a period of slow population decline that extended for 50 years. This reversal is not by accident or caused by happenstance, but relates directly to the urban policies and the community development practices enabled by the DC Comprehensive Plan. At this moment, I'd like to share a pre-recorded welcoming address from Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development, John Falciccio, and following the deputy mayor's welcome, Andrew Trueblood will make a short presentation introducing the proposed revision to the district's comprehensive plan, and then we'll move to, to dialogue. Hello, I'm John Falcicchio, Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development. Good morning and welcome to the 20 years of comprehensive planning in the District of Columbia. Today, we're privileged to have with us five planning directors spanning two decades together to share how comprehensive planning has spurred revitalization and growth in the district. First, I want to thank Georgetown Global Cities Initiative for hosting this important event. UE Brandis at Georgetown for leading this effort and working closely with the OP team on this event. 
and Director Andrew Trueblood and his team at the Office of Planning for all of their work. We know that an updated comprehensive plan is essential to achieve our goals for a vibrant, equitable, and resilient DC. And there are many pressing reasons why we're urging the council to pass an updated comprehensive plan this year. The update will guide the district's COVID-19 recovery, not only by helping us address the immediate public health crisis, but also address the economic and racial justice inequities that have been amplified by the pandemic. The update will also support the district's acute housing needs by aligning the comp plan with the district's housing goals and more equitably distributing affordable housing across all eight wards. As you know, Mayor Bowser set a bold goal to produce 36,000 homes by 2025, including 12,000 affordable homes. Mayor Bowser made us the first city in the country to set affordable housing goals by neighborhood with our 2019 housing equity report. I'm happy to report that we've produced nearly 30% of the 36,000 new homes and 14% of the affordable new homes. But a comprehensive plan approval will accelerate that pace and give us more tools to meet these goals. Thank you again for participating today and for your active engagement in this process. Be safe and have a great event. Thank you. And Andrew, I'd like to turn it over to you. Uh, great. Thank you, Uva, uh, and thank you, uh, fellow directors, for joining today. I'm really excited by this event. Uh, I think it's important, uh, a, a really important opportunity uh, to, to do what I'm doing right now, which is talking about looking forward, but really to put it in the context of all of the hard work of the last 20 years. Because I think as we've talked about this event, which was originally supposed to happen in April uh, in person, uh, as, as we've talked about it, what we've seen is it really where we are now is really building on all of the great work of the last 20 years. Uh, and, and this event is an opportunity to contextualize that and to have us all together and really talk about it uh, from, from, from that experience. And so I'm excited by it. Um, next slide. Speaking of the past, I'll briefly just, um, I will, oh, I see a note saying I'm breaking up. Can you all hear me okay? Uva, can you hear me okay? Uh, it's, it's a little bit slow, Andrew. You, okay. you may consider cutting your video, which may help the audio. All right. I'll stop my video. Um, so uh, it's worth just mentioning, just starting uh, with what we're talking about when we talk about the comprehensive plan. Many cities have uh, documents like these, a comprehensive plan or a generalized plan that is meant to look uh, into the future of the city. Uh, it's meant to, to, to take a step back from the daily um, issues of potholes or school curriculum or picking up trash to say, what do we envision uh, for ourselves? And it's, a, it's a really a critical exercise uh, that many uh, cities and, and, and areas go through. Um, while the district has had comprehensive plans really going back to the mid, of, mid, mid, of, mid part of the 20th century, uh, I think in our modern era, it really is um, the early, this, this 2004 uh, vision for growing an inclusive city uh, that, that is kind of the first kind of singular comprehensive plan that we have had and put together since home rule. Um, and it, there was a vision uh, put together by some people uh, who are here today. Uh, and, and that then followed with uh, the comprehensive plan uh, document uh, that was passed in 2006 uh, with an update in 2011 uh, that I would say is, was a, a kind of a small or a moderate update uh, with, with a number of technical uh, changes and, and, and things like that. But, uh, what we're going through uh, right now is another update, and what I would say is a major update, uh, given how much the city has changed. Uh, next slide, please. So just uh, as a little bit more background, our comprehensive plan, uh, I guess since this is a technical audience, I will, I will mention there's a federal component of the comprehensive plan called the Federal Elements, which is um, completed by the National Capital Planning Commission, uh, which is a federal body that, that I sit on on behalf of the mayor. Um, but then we have our district elements, and that's what these are. These are each chapters that we have, uh, and, and you see there about half of the chapters are, are looking at citywide elements and systems, um, like housing. Uh, and then we have uh, 10 different areas uh, called area elements. Oftentimes we get asked, why are we using these areas and not wards? And the answer is really twofold. Most importantly, wards are political boundaries, uh, and they're set they're, they change every 10 years. They've already changed once uh, in this comprehensive plan and will be changing again next year. 
So um, when you're thinking about long-term physical planning, that's hard uh, to, to address if, you're, if your boundaries are changing. And secondly, this allows us to group similarly, uh, similar neighbors together, whereas uh, political boundaries you know, have to have a certain number of people in them and, and there are other constraints. This allows us uh, to create contiguous um, areas to plan for. Each of these have elements uh, that are you know, somewhere between 40 and 100 pages usually. Um, and, and talk about um, talk and, 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 and get into each of these topics or areas. Um, the next slide. So uh, it's important to note uh, that the comprehensive plan is a document um, that is, is, is put together by the mayor as the, pl the planner for the District of Columbia. And it, it, it is a guiding document, um, even though it is passed by the council. Well, I, I would say it is passed by the council, which is critical because it means that there's buy-in across the different components of the District of Columbia, or the different um, bodies. But it is not uh, self-effectuating, self as our attorneys say. It is not a law per se that requires things. It guides lots of things. And I think that's important to say, because um, sometimes I think people think that by putting something in the comprehensive plan, it sort of creates a law or creates a mandate. It cannot and it will not. Um, what create laws are the council, and what create budgets are the mayor approved by council, and those those are the things that actually um, get us where we want to go. But the comp plan, if it's effective, can guide all of that. Um, but it does, an important thing it does do, as many around uh, here recognize, is that uh, it guides zoning. Uh, our zoning cannot be inconsistent with the comprehensive plan. So there is sort of a legal connection with our zoning, um, as well as with things like small area planning and large tract review and other land use um, uh, components of our city. Um, and finally, it does uh, have to align with our capital improvements plan, our, our six-year uh, capital budget. Um, next slide. So when we talk about uh, this, this document, uh, it's, 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 it's long. Uh, it is uh, over 1,000 pages. Uh, so there is a lot to talk about at various levels. We've been focusing uh, for this particular round of updates on some of the major themes, some of the major things that we've updated or added to um, over the original document. And I think if you look at these, uh, these themes, uh, what's interesting, I look at these themes and I look at my fellow uh, planning directors, um, I think they, res they, they hit on a number of things that all of the planning directors have worked on and that we worked on uh, over not only uh, the last two years, but the last 20. Um, but I will say, uh, interestingly enough, I, 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 we, this came out, uh, we sent this to council in April, obviously just as COVID was happening. We did a review. Uh, to make sure that it was still that COVID and what and all the uncertainty that was causing uh, that didn't require us to re reevaluate the comp plan, and we found that actually the comp plan as a long term document is is actually not only addresses many of the things the concerns around COVID and recovery, uh, but is actually necessary. Uh, some of these updates are really critical so that we can we can be we can be well situated to move forward with recovery. Um, what, some some minor things we did was update. Um, we updated uh, the, the language around um, natural disasters to include things like public health emergencies, which you know I just don't think we had thought about before. Um, but but a number of the issues around resilience, um, monitoring the ongoing recovery uh, or the, the ongoing situation, those are all in the document. Um, equity and racial justice uh, were also here before the summer. Obviously, this went to council in uh, April. Uh, but uh, really acknowledging uh, the inequities uh, in our system, uh, not only around land use, uh, we have a whole new section around public health equity. Uh, we have a whole section around food access and equity. Um, and so uh, we actually, uh, I encourage those who are interested in these issues, we have a crosswalk that really looks through the document and uh, highlights all of, the, um, all of the actions and policies and narrative around equity and racial justice throughout the document, um, because that's, uh, it really, it, whether you're talking about public facilities, housing, uh, infrastructure, it all, all of it uh, has an equity component and lens, and we have actions and policies that, that talk about those. Um, housing, uh, it's number three here, but in some ways I think it is, it is the top priority uh, of, of what this update is all about. Um, and uh, you heard it from the deputy mayor, making sure uh, that we can address all of the housing pressures in our city by producing the housing we need, uh, both uh, uh, just not market rate, but also affordable, uh, preserving affordability, um, and thinking about how it's all done uh, from an equity lens. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. But I would say housing is really, if not uh, if not a driving force, the driving, if not the driving force, a driving force of the of this update. 
Uh, resilience, a term that wasn't even around uh, when, comp when the comp plan was originally approved. Uh, the idea, not only thinking about um, climate change and how we address that, but how we address all sorts of naturally and man-made shocks, natural and man-made shocks and stressors. Um, how is how is our infrastructure ready? How are our facilities ready? How do we not only um, address them, but how do we respond and how do we um, recover? And then finally, public resources uh, is it, you know it's kind of the least um, uh, shiny of all these things, but I think it's really critical thinking about how we plan, uh, how we coordinate uh, investments in our in our public facilities, how we think about our public facilities as. Uh, a stage, uh, which Eric Shaw might be able to speak to, uh, as, as a place for uh, cultural um, uh, acknowledgement and cultural production, um, and also how we think about our public life. Uh, this We have a section about streeteries that was written before the summer, um, but really how do we think about that space between the buildings, that public space, and, and how we're using it, and how do we use it better and, and, and um, for all of our residents. Uh, the next slide uh, is, in addition to the, the elements that I mentioned, there are two maps that are important. One is a generalized policy map. Um, it has all, sorts of, has all sorts of information, but I, I wanted to highlight this because it shows kind of almost our work plan for the next couple of years of implementation. Um, it's important because it shows where we think there are areas of, of, of potential uh, need for small area planning or change. Uh, those are the areas in red or darkish red. Those are the uh, future planning analysis areas. And the upper, you'll see there are two in Upper Northwest that I'll speak to in a minute. Um, also a few uh, east of the river, uh, as well as along the river. Um, and then there's areas, resilience focus areas. Uh, those are in blue, really aligning with where the river, where the future floodplain might be. And I would argue that this is really the next generation of some of the work that Andy Altman started with his, uh, with the Anacostia waterfront. Um, whereas I think that was focused, you know, a lot on on how do we how do we engage and 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 really enliven the river. I think now we're saying how do we do that and also take into account the realities of things like sea level rise, additional you know of flooding. Uh, how, how can we and and have great public spaces at the same time? And then finally, uh, for everybody, uh, there is the we added the proposed boundary for the the state of Washington Douglas Commonwealth. Uh, you see that red in the middle. Uh, so inside that would be the future District of Columbia and the rest would be uh, the state of, the, of DC. Uh, so that is something that we think is important to highlight in our policy map. Finally, uh, on the future land use map uh, on the next slide, not finally, this is the last piece on the comp plan. Uh, you know, I think what's important is this map uh, is, is an important map that guides if, mostly it can guide zoning, but it can guide other things too. Um, and it has been, uh, I think, one of the main components of some of the challenges that we've had on some of the developments and, and planned unit developments and litigation that we've seen. Our goal with the future land use map is really to align our priorities around equity, housing production, um, and growth, uh, or, or realities of growth with our priorities of equity, uh, with, our, uh, with the realities uh, that we're facing as a city with sustainability. Um, and so you see, we've we've um, what I would say what we, this term called upflum. We've we, it's not a zone, so we didn't upzone anything, but we've we've created more opportunity, especially for housing across the city. We've uh, changed about six percent of the of the um, designations, which gets about fifteen percent more development and housing opportunities, which we think is critical and reduces pressure in other areas of the city. Um, so it really is about supporting it, that growth while also um, addressing uh, resilience and equity um, and balancing competing demands. There, we, we know we will always need production, distribution, and repair or industrial land. We also need housing. Uh, so where those come head to head, how do we, how do we address those? Um, but how, at the end of the day, do we make sure we have the housing and the affordable housing and the family housing that we need uh, for the city? Um, so the next two slides I'll briefly go through. Uh, the, the deputy mayor mentioned the mayor's housing goals. Uh, she put these out at her second inaugural address, um, really in terms of how do we continue to, to en enliven, uh, uh, create an equitable city where everyone and our children and grandchildren can live. She signed a mayor's order that connected everything from homelessness to home, home ownership, uh, but also around the need to increase and accelerate housing production, um, and also the need to connect to federal and regional initiatives. We've been working very closely with the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments, for example, to pass a regional housing goal um, uh, that includes both a numerical goal for number of housing units, affordability, and accessibility to transportation. 
So it is recognizing, I saw um, in the chat that we have people from all over the district, but also the region. Um, and this has really been a regional effort that we see playing out uh, across jurisdictions. The next uh, slide really gets into um, an important, it's not just about, about uh, the raw number, it's not just about affordability, but it's about where. Uh, if you look at the slide on the left, it shows where where our um, subsidized housing units are in the city. Um, and like many maps that we see, uh, it shows an east-west divide um, uh, that's pretty stark. And so um, through a, a process of, of, of putting this out, engaging residents, analyzing uh, possibilities, uh, the mayor set a new goal for 2025 uh, of the 12,000 units, how that would be divided across these planning areas. And you see there's some like Rock Creek West, Capitol Hill, and uh, Rock Creek East that have um, pretty high uh, housing, affordable housing goals. So what's important about these goals is while they are about for 2025, the ideas behind them um, and, and the fundamental um, goals around more production are built into the comprehensive plan. The comprehensive plan has a goal of ensuring that every planning area has at least 15% affordable housing by 2040. Um, and that's, that's the equity goal that if you work back from is actually how we got these numbers that you see on the right. Finally, um, I, I haven't talked much about process. This is my last slide, um, but it's worth noting uh, that this has been uh, quite a, a long and, and impressive process. Um, I actually started with Eric Shaw, who's here, um, and who can speak to, to some of the amazing um, outreach and engagement that happened a few years ago. Um, just, I think the, you'll see there are 3,000 public amendment submissions that were received in 2017. And I think that's a sign of a few things, a sign of how the city is changing uh, and, and how that city has changed since 2006. I think it's a sign of, of the level of interest uh, in these issues, also evidenced by the number of people are joining us today. So thank you all for joining us. Um, and, I, and I think uh, it's a sign that, that the document really needed to be updated. Uh, we also incorporated over 40 plans from other DC agencies, um, as well as the Office of Planning, uh, many uh, that were worked on by people who are here uh, on this panel with me today. Um, and so this document includes just a great deal of input from residents, uh, from stakeholders, uh, from, uh, from other agencies. Um, for those who are really in the weeds, you'll know that we've introduced the framework element, which is the first element that really defines a number of the, the features of the, of, 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 the, of the comp plan and helps set the stage for it. That was introduced in January 2018 and passed last October, uh, at, which then freed us up to release our public draft for public review last October. Um, and we heard from 90, we, we, we really did an ANC uh, advisory neighborhood commission focused outreach. We heard from 90% of the ANCs, uh, which I think is a, a major success um, and just a major level of engagement. Um, luckily, right before COVID happened, um, but we've heard, we heard a great deal of input from there. We made some changes, including um, adding some future planning analysis areas like you saw in um, Upper Connecticut Avenue, um, where we're trying to figure out how to build more housing, but also do it uh, contextually. And then um, we, we submitted the document, the mayor submitted it to the council in April. Uh, we have hearings uh, coming up November 12th and 13th. Uh, and you should, if you're interested, feel free to testify, that, or sign up to testify. You can also submit, uh, yeah, submit your own written document if, you don't, if you're not interested in testifying live um, that, uh, through December 3rd. So um, we've been saying, as you heard from the, the, the deputy mayor, it really is critical that we adopt this document um, this year in order to be able to move forward with our goals around housing and equity and recovery. Um, and so uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully that's something that the council will move on. Uh, you see, for those who are really in the weeds, you see here that um, there's a few more steps that have to follow. Um, uh, that are sort of technical, um, and but then where we get to the exciting work of implementing them and doing the planning that you saw on that generalized policy map. So I think with that, Uva, uh, that is my that is the slide deck. Uh, and so, oh no, not Uva, Don. I will now turn it over to you. All right. Thank you so much, Andrew, and uh, good morning to everyone out there. I certainly wish we were all together in person. Um, over the last 20 years, it's been my privilege to facilitate many comp plan related assessment, revision and update meetings. And I've done it with thousands of DC residents and stakeholders like you. You are all actually investors in comprehensive planning. 
And you have helped to propel the District of Columbia and its neighborhoods into the 21st century. And along the way, you have indeed, in my opinion, helped create something that had not existed before. And that's a world-class city that is attracting hundreds and thousands of people every year. So well done. Now, we don't have a lot of time, so I'm gonna jump right into the ground rules. And it really wouldn't be a meeting if I didn't give talk about ground rules. So um, number one, I've already talked with the panelists and asked them to speak with candor. I didn't really have to do that. They're gonna do that. Um, but I also wanna say that I'll only intervene if things get too technical or too awash in data or too polemical. Notice I said too polemical, um, so there's some room. Um, each of you will have five minutes to stake out your preferred terrain. And I'm gonna call on you in order of your uh, service. Uh, and for that five minutes, you can speak on any number of topics. You can respond to Andrew as you see fit or raise something else that you wanna follow up when we actually begin to talk uh, in the discussion. Um, I'm not gonna exercise the extreme time management that I am capable of exercising, but I will remind you that there is a mute button um, and we will use it if we have to. Um, finally, we are expecting to receive numerous uh, questions via chat and I will uh, take as many as I can. They will be given to me by the staff that's behind the curtain. Um, but any question that um, is not answered during this session will be answered. And I'll give you some information about that uh, before we finish. Now, um, I will just finally say to the panelists, remember you've all got two minutes for your final words. So please share the mic and uh, recognize that uh, we'll all be interested in reading your books later on. Um, so first of all, let's jump right in and let's start with Andy. Um, you listened to uh, Andrew's presentation. Uh, in some ways we could all say it's your fault, Andy, but uh, what's on your mind having uh, listened to Andrew and getting us started? Um, well, thanks. Thanks, Don, um, and uh, set my uh, timer. And thank you. Um, so first of all, I want to thank also Uva for putting this together, um, because I think my reflection is, and you know, listening to Andrew um, and knowing what he's doing um, is, and seeing all the planning directors here, I haven't seen all together in one place, and what incredible people they are, professionals, and the work that they've done is this really speaks to the continuity of city planning and the institution of city planning. And the fact that, um, you know, the district has been able uh, for so many 20 years now to continue to have a strong planning function and to be able to attract, as you can see on the screen, um, level of planning directors and leadership, which continued through Mayor Bowser, um, is really extraordinary. And I think the district has to acknowledge that. I mean, this does not happen in every city um, that you have this kind of continuity. So I wanna step back in the couple minutes I have because um, I think this is really profound. And I think that you have to recall for those of you who don't, you know, um, the history uh, going back this 20 years and Andrew put up the vision for a growing city that planning was in a very different place in 1999, right? That was a huge turning point. Um, it was a turning point of the election of Mayor Williams and Mayor Williams was elected on a platform of doing rebuilding planning in the District of Columbia. And that was because of the outcry of probably many people who were on this, you know, uh, watching of community groups and others saying planning was broken. That the city, remember, was in receivership then. It was run by a control board, right? It is hard to imagine that. I mean, control board sort of says it all, right? And, you know, the city wasn't doing its own planning, right? It was the majority of the planning was happening in the federal government. There were maybe 10 planners in the Office of Planning, maybe a little bit more, but not many. And the community group said enough. And the comprehensive plan back then, importantly, was seen as broken. It was not seen 
as a vision for the city. It was not seen as an inspirational plan. It was seen as a transactional document, right? We amend the comp plan every four years. I'm gonna worry about my narrow issue, whatever that may be. I'm gonna fix this lot. I'm gonna fix this you know, area of the city. It may or may not be consistent with anything else. 500 and some of it, you know, and it was just, it was a transactional process. It was clearly broken. So Mayor Williams, one, because there's tremendous outcry and two, because he personally, right, philosophically and intellectually believed in the power of planning um, to shape the uh, growth of a city. And I think that's really important. That was a huge, I think, turning point in the city because important to a city is both having a strong institution of planning that transcends mayors, that transcends planning directors and seeing the planning directors here that goes from one to the other who keep a tradition of strong city planning. Um, that is really, really, really important. So I think if I had one message in all this that the district should feel great about and to Andrew's point about why adopting this comprehensive plan and voting on it is so critical is because it is the foundational document of planning, right? It is called the constitution of land use, right? And, but that doesn't really capture it fully in the sense that, you know, what Mayor Williams and what I think subsequent mayors have seen is that planning and the comprehensive plan speaks also to your identity as a city, right? It, it has to be rooted in an understanding of the history of the city. We have a very rich planning tradition, right? Von Fond, Olmsted, Burnham, et cetera. It has to be relevant to the pressing issues of a city. So what Andrew laid out, right, of the current issues, right? Dealing with, you know, response to COVID, dealing with equity and racial justice. It has to be relevant. The comp plan 1999 was not looked at as relevant. It has to be relevant. But it has to be future oriented, right? It can't just be history and present. You got to say, where are we going? It's a framework to guide where you're going as a city and dealing with those issues and where you want to be. Not a static picture, not an end state, right? That was that was the critique of comprehensive planning is that it would sort of paint an end state. And it wasn't realistic and it wasn't relevant. Go ahead, Don. I see you like itching to cut me off. Am I done? Yeah. <laughs> Thank that you. Five minutes. I put my yeah. timer on go up yet. Andy, you got to preach it and I was like, amen, but okay, we got to hear from Ellen. Go. You turn your mic on, Ellen. You would think after all those Zoom classes, I could remember that. Um, I, I would, uh, of, of course, very much follow in and uh, the same trail as Andy, which I'm used to doing, um, <laughs> but it's uh, it's good to go back. Or if you've not written a brand new and what an enormous undertaking that is, and particularly if you go back to the context that Andy was setting of having an office of planning that was decimated, a city that was that was bankrupt. Uh, a city whose population had gone from 800,000 people down to 550,000 in the space of just 40 years. Uh, so that was the task that we began with, um, but there was an extraordinary support from the mayor and the council to provide enormous resources so that we could support two task forces, meetings in every ANC and ward, um, uh, now we look back on it and say, wow, remember we set up a website. We thought that was so incredibly innovative. And at the end, we said, we had a million and a half hits on our website. You know, now one of those little pipsqueak, uh, 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 what do they call them? Not demonstrator, but anyhow, the, the, the little millennials that, that shill for lipstick or, um, do TikTok dances, you know, that they would laugh for a million and a half. Pardon me? Influencers? Influencers, yes, thank you. Um, uh, but the, the uh, what was particularly important we discovered as we were putting the plan together was the, it, the original plan was based on 1980 census data. When, by the time we were able to update it with uh, 1990 and then 2000 census data, 
the disparities between the east and west sides of the city were so strong, which helped just automatically almost lead us to the underlying theme of growing an inclusive city. So we were growing for the first time and we wanted to be inclusive. What's fascinating is to see the revolution, the evolution of the comprehensive plan since that time. We were going for a growing an inclusive city and one of the things was to um, focus on places where we could grow without displacing anyone. So we highlighted Walter Reed and the Anacostia waterfront and um, the, the, uh, uh, the, the convention center site and others where, uh, where basically we could grow and not displace any of the existing residents. And then we um, looked at our first stab at, at inclusivity was where could we get affordable, housing, talk about improved um, facil public facilities. Uh, but now when we, when we but we, we were a little short of tools for one thing, we didn't have inclusionary zoning, we didn't have community land trusts in any kind of major way. What, what the comprehensive plan now can build on is, is not just the targets that Andrew has set, the very ambitious targets from the mayor's uh, plan, but also to focus on ways that we can really empower the um, neighborhoods to, um, to have equity, to have capital and equity that they can control in their own neighborhood. And I think that's the next frontier. Um, but the, the uh, recommendations that have been made in the future land use map on areas like uh, mine in Upper Northwest are so important in terms of coupling the increased density along the avenues in proximity to metro stations with the requirements for affordable housing so we can build uh, vitality into th those neighborhoods and arterials. But also there's an important part of the proposed comp plan that delves in more depth with um, urban design. So we can, how, how can we design so that we get that extra density and height along the avenues, but we step down in a respectful way to the single family residences that are behind them. And well, we focus on creating great places. Thank you. Okay, Harriet. Good morning. Um, it is really a pleasure to be able to be here with all my colleagues. Um, uh, and and uh, let me just say that uh, <clears throat> it just kind of reminds me of how very uh, thrilled uh, I was, uh, uh, you know, when uh, Andy talked me into taking the job at, uh, 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 at, at DC Planning, even though I really didn't think uh, I was worthy of doing it. Um, and I still feel that way, that this was the luckiest thing that kind of ever happened to me. And, and DC uh, is an amazing place. Um, and I think in, in a lot of ways, um, uh, my tenure uh, under uh, Mayor Fenty and Mayor Gray um, was about um, really kind of pointing out <clears throat> what some of the great uh, qualities, unique qualities of the district. Andy started out by talking about the respect for planning. And I give uh, he and Mayor Williams an, an enormous amount of credit for really uh, rebuilding uh, the, the, a, a great office of planning, uh, you know, a, a, an office that is uh, the envy of, I think, uh, cities around the US. Uh, and it made it very easy for me to, to uh, follow Ellen and step into that role um, because the staff was so amazingly great. But I always um, had worked nationally before I started working in DC. And what's really struck me is uh, these things about the district that were different than other U.S. cities, um, the transportation choices. And during my tenure, I focused a lot on emphasizing transportation. You know, affordability for housing is a hugely important thing, but the second biggest household cost is transportation. And especially now in this post-COVID, um, well, hopefully uh, not yet post-COVID, but hopefully soon, you know, one of the things we're really uh, made aware of is, is, how, um, how important transportation is, 
um, how important it is to access the regional job market. Uh, we've had, you know, uh, an incredibly unequal experience uh, across the country, but in the district, uh, in, in terms of who was getting sick, who was losing hours and jobs, um, you know, who was struggling and who was prospering. And I think that uh, transportation uh, is, is, a, is a big part of that. Whether or not you're gonna be able to find another job depends on whether or not you can access the jobs in the region, not just the ones that are in your neighborhood. Um, I think it's not a coincidence that um, bus ridership is now greater than rail ridership at, at WMATA for the first time in many decades. Um, and that uh, and if, even though WMATA is struggling, we need more uh, transit service. We need more people to have better service. There's not just inequities in the city and housing, but also in, in, in transit. Um, I will just say that when I was um, uh, at planning, we had a recession, right? Uh, we had a, uh, a global recession. And, and one of the things when we talk about resilience, uh, you know, I noticed that uh, hundreds of cars began to drop off the DMV rolls in DC uh, in 2008. And I thought people were fleeing the jurisdiction, right? That after five decades of losing population, we were about to start doing it again. Uh, but no, people were dialing down their transportation costs because they could. So two car households became one car households, one car households became zero car households. And we had almost no foreclosure or bankruptcy in the district compared to other jurisdictions in our same regional jobs and housing market. And the district didn't just have a better experience, but we bounced forward and gained for the next decade on the region's share of population and job growth. And I think that resilience is going to be important to us going forward. Thanks, Eric. Hi, everyone. Um, so first off, I see a lot of the OP staff and community members on there. And I just want to say hello to everyone. And I want everyone to realize what a heavy lift this was, I think when I walked into Andrew's office and John Feltrecki was chief of staff at the time and said, this will be done in two years, there'll be amendment, you know, you know, what's a minor update? And we, we just realized that, um, you know, I'm in a new position right now and, 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 and I'm just happy to see the continuity and leadership of Andrew and John. I just really want to thank the staff who did this work. Um, I think that, you know, um, I was the first African American plan director, I think, in 20 years, and, and embarking on this process really um, had our team take to heart the idea of what inclusivity meant and really understanding how much the city had changed, what we had heard from the community, and tried to find as many ways as possible um, to lift up voices and really bring out. Um, the balance of the, both the, the, the opportunity and challenge that comes with progress and the, the real challenge around being inclusive in a city that was growing as fast as it was. And so balancing historic preservation um, along with African-American identity and using it as a tool, like we found in the establishment of the Kingman, Island, excuse me, of the Kingman Park Historic District um, and really looking at um, for example, forces driving change, how Uber and technology had created this opportunity for people to have more access, that people east of the river could find jobs and have access to, to low cost transportation to find jobs. But also that meant that people who hadn't considered neighborhoods, other places now felt the opportunity for those to open up. And so constantly trying to understand the balance between um, what growth meant and how inclusivity was there. Um, I'm really happy that uh, we got some big things done, the cultural plan, the public space work. Um, as I saw, don't do DC, as I look at the Black Lives Matters Plaza, a lot of those were outgrowths from community efforts around placemaking, around the community identity, around affirming um, people's right to be in place. And I'm really excited about the work that was done there. And finally, I just wanna say that um, it really is important that we did the framework element and the fact that that was done, I think that we really pushed to make sure that even if it took some time to get the rest of the plan done, we had to have that inclusive narrative around housing justice, around anti-displacement, around resilience, around clarifying land use descriptions. And so um, as I think about the rest of the plan that has to be done, I just really wanna thank the staff and um, just thank the leadership of Mayor Bowser 
for making sure we had to get the context and story right and the framework element. And so uh, that we, we do have some basis in which to continue to grow. Um, and so I think I hit my, my time, Don, but wanted to lift that up. So first of all, let me just say thank you to everyone. You've said so much. Unfortunately, we don't have all the time this, this conversation deserves. So I'm going to jump right in. Um, and, you know, in this national moment we're in, um, I think about the following. Number one, 17 years ago, the mayor, Mayor Williams, was talking about an inclusive city. That was in 2003 that he introduced that idea of a vision for an inclusive city at Citizen Summit number three. Now, here we are in 2020, and in this national moment, I am forced to ask, have we created an inclusive city for all, a city that works for all, in a city in which all neighborhoods are neighborhoods of choice, which was the fundamental proposal in the vision? Who wants to go first? So, Eric, smiling. I like that smile. Go ahead, Eric. Um, I, I, so I think yes and no. I think the yes is that we have policies in place. Um, we have a community infrastructure in place to receive feedback on that. I think the unfortunate thing is that sort of market policy and politics, there's a lag between in the policy responsive and immediate community need, i.e. it's taking six years to get this plan approved by, by council. Um, but, you know, I think that we push always, I always say this is that highest and best was highest return in terms of housing and economic return in terms of development. But the best was really listing of policies that made the city inclusive, safe, creating neighborhoods of choice. And I think that um, from working with our staff, we worked every day to make sure that we, every development that was done and all the work that was done, we were including the policies and embodying the policies that implement the idea of inclus inclusivity and of choice. Now, we can never sort of adjust that lag, but I think that um, a lot of people woke up and thought that we, we worked antithetical to that, but every day we were using the comp plan as, a, as, the, as the basis for pushing for inclusive, inclusivity and for making neighborhoods of choice. So the unfortunate lag is there, but the policy and meat is there. Andy, what do you think? Andy or Andrew? It's a good way I can refer <laughs> that. Oh, okay. Um, Andy. So, you know, Andy, I, I knew that was where you were headed. Um, so, you know, look, it's a great question. I think these are big issues that take time, right? That are, gen that don't just get solved overnight. There are big forces and the city only has so much it controls. And you have to ask yourself, do you think the city is doing everything in its power to try to address some of these fundamental, you know, questions about an inclusive city? I think if you look back, you know, and identified, as you said, Don, um, how to, one of the, let's just take one issue of housing and affordable housing and creating housing choices. Um, you know, a, a little known, little thing we did at the time was said, well, let's just increase the recordation fee and that'll create this housing trust fund. At the time, because there wasn't an enormous amount of growth, it seemed like a fairly innocuous thing to do. And the mayor and uh, Eric Price, Steve Green, people who are working on housing issues, got, got that legislation passed to the council. Today, right, it's incredibly robust. Andrew will speak to that, it's 100 million a year, whatever the number is. So you, you, you have to really say, are you putting as much effort as possible in and are you making steps toward creating the most inclusive city you can? Are we there yet? No. And that's why, I mean, Andrew's report, I think is brilliant. The housing equity analysis shows you very clearly this divide. It doesn't just get addressed overnight, but there has to be a concerted effort and the continuity of continuing to say, we are not yet there. We are trying to get there. It's been exacerbated because you have huge market forces, but are we as a city trying to do everything we can? And I, just to say, I mean, I think I read an announcement and not to cast dispersions in any particular jurisdiction, but some jurisdiction announced, I think Virginia, oh, we are doing $4 million in affordable housing this year. And I thought the district doesn't get enough credit and Mayor Bowser enough credit 
for the effort on affordable housing that is so profound. No one does per capita, I can be corrected, the amount. And I think it's extraordinary. There are ways to go, but there's a foundation. Andrew's piece, adopting this comp plan, and they're putting their money where their policies are. That's really fundamental. Jump in, jump in, Harriet, Ellen. I would say that, um, you know, Andy's made, made some very good points about the housing trust fund, but I think that one of the things that the district has always been very good about is, uh, especially from the planning department, is not necessarily staying in your own lane. You know, planning is about everything. Uh, you know, it's about transportation, it's about open space, it's about diversifying the economy, the very economy of the city. Um, you know, and I think that one of the, one of the things that, that uh, maybe uh, the city needs to do more of going forward is looking at what some of the other uh, obstacles are to realizing this vision of an inclusive city. Um, you know, I, uh, when I was planning director, we did some updates of the, of the zoning code for the first time in 50 years. And one of the things we changed was to allow accessory dwelling units by right in almost every residential zone. So making some inroads that other cities are also now trying to make to make those, those single family zones less exclusionary, less exclusive and allow more housing. But for the, the many low and moderate income homeowners in DC, and we have a lot of them, um, you know, they're, they often have very limited access to credit. You know, so even to put an ADU in their, in their basement or in their backyard, um, you know, has been very challenging. Um, I, think, I think tools like credit enhancement, my next job after leaving the city was to work at HUD, uh, doing community planning and development and a lot of housing finance. And I think there are a lot of other things we could be doing in the city to enable people to stay in the city, to help them close the wealth gap, right, with their white counterparts in the district. And I think that, you know, that really uh, maybe demands some attention going forward, not just what can the city do by itself, but what could a bunch of other people uh, who have private wealth, who, who run banks, who do other things, what could we do to really change things in the district when it comes to uh, uh, making it uh, more inclusive and, and, and across the board? Ellen. Turn your mic on, Ellen. Okay. I think what's interesting in terms of the, there's, there's a lot of things that we need to do with regard to inclusivity that are outside the realm of just land use and the comprehensive plan. But one of the things which is embedded in what Andrew has proposed for this year is recognizing if we go back to Raj Chetty and the Harvard Opportunity Project, that key to the success of children is the, the neighborhoods that they grow up in and the focus on um, making it possible for affordable housing to be built throughout the city in places like Upper Connecticut Avenue and Upper Wisconsin where we have good schools, nice parks, excellent access to transportation. There's, there's been in the past a lot of resistance to that notion and yet that's such an important way that we can achieve a more inclusive city. So I'm hoping that when we see the, the uh, testimony before the city council on November 12th and 13th, that there will be a huge groundswell of support from people in areas that have been known to resist the more affordable housing in the past to recognize that it's really important that we share uh, the, the um, opportunity to, to live throughout the city wherever people want to and for all of those places to be quality neighborhoods. So Andrew, I'm going to ask you to, to also comment, but I'm going to give you another question to pivot into. You're the current planning director. What is facing uh, the district planning uh, horizon today? What, what's the number one issue that you think is going to set the comprehensive planning agenda for the next 20 years? Uh, well, there, there, there's a question. Uh, <laughs> so, I, I, you know, I think, uh, I, think that I, would, I would answer that in two ways. 
Um, and one of them I answered in my in, in the presentation, which is I think the issue that is most pressing that we hear uh, in the Office of Planning when we're in neighborhoods, that the mayor hears, that council hears, the biggest issue is around housing and people's ability uh, to, to live in the city, for their children to live in the city, and their grandchildren to live in the city. And I think that is, uh, that is number one uh, that we hear. Granted, there are also some fundamental issues around climate change, sea level rise. I mean, I think there are a whole host of, of, of threats to people's ability to live in the city that I think we are, are facing and are going to continue to face. So uh, I would put those in sort of this substantive area. Um, I think there's a fundamental question uh, that planning itself has, uh, and it has had, um, uh, about what its role is. Uh, I, and and, and I, I see it a lot. In fact, um, we meet with the with the, with the regional directors, the directors of the various jurisdictions around the region um, monthly. And, and I think uh, planning for many years was hearing uh, what uh, neighbors said and putting that into a document. Um, and I think now uh, to your question, Don, your earlier question, I think the answer is no, we haven't reached that. Um, I don't think planning in and of itself can reach, can do that, right? The, the, uh, reaching those ideals that you mentioned around equity and opportunity require, it, you know, to, to think that planning alone causes or can solve that is, I think, um, with setting everyone up for failure. But what it can do is help move the conversation, help contextualize it, and um, help surface these structures and these systems, right? Um, Ellen pointed out how land use has been used as a system creating inequities, creating segregation, furthering racial inequities. So how do we first surface that and then have these hard conversations to say, hey, you might not have a racist, you might not be racist at all, but you are still benefiting from the, the effects of, of that, of, of what our city has faced over the last 50 years. So uh, what does that mean? How do we resolve that? How do we solve that? And as planners, maybe we have to lean into those uncomfortable conversations and try and resolve those things. And I think that is what it is, you know, given uh, all that we're facing, uh, given all the questions of the futures of cities, of racial injustice in our city, uh, in our country, uh, given sustainability, like that is what planning is. It's really facing some of these fundamental issues. And, and I guess I'll just finally say, um, uh, almost every day I think about and reflect upon the serenity prayer, you know, know what what you can control and can't control and the difference between the two. And I think the, I think planning needs to do that same thing. Uh, understand what it can and cannot control. Um, it, you know, there are things that we, that are, are beyond uh, the control of any document. The comp plan is a guide. It's not a legislative. We're not elected officials. Uh, we're not, we don't create capitalism. Um, and so understanding those things will help us then focus on the things that we can change, the conversations we can change, the policies that we can change or we can affect. Um, and I think that's, that is what I think about as we, as we look forward. So I'm going to tell just a very quick story. I'm going to throw out a name. If you've not heard of it, you should wiki on him. His name is Harlan Bartholomew. Uva has heard me talk about this guy before. When you think about the first planner, the first professional planner in the United States was this guy named Harlan Bartholomew. Harlan Bartholomew and his firm eventually wrote approximately 500 of the comprehensive or master plans of the cities of the United States. Now, anybody who's really looking at the question of justice and equity kind of understands that though he was a, a man of his time, which was in the early part of the 20th century, Harlan Bartholomew was a white supremacist, period. In my opinion, we are looking at the cities, we are living in the cities that Harlan Bartholomew designed. So, if we're gonna talk about deconstruction of injustice and increasing equity and justice, I'd like very much to know, and I'm sure members of our audience would like to know, one specific action, and, and Andrew, you, you're talking about housing, but I'd really like to hear the other directors weigh in on their number one top recommendation that would be looked at as we think about comprehensive planning and adopting this comprehensive plan. Who wants to go? So I, I would say that we have to um, redefine what success is. You know, I think, you know, I, I worked with Andrew 15 years ago as a Capital City Fellow in 2000. Um, 
And I think that when I came back as planning director, people were like, look at Union Market. Isn't that beautiful? Like, we are successful. And that's, you know, and, and to me, hearing these conversations now around do people have access to jobs and opportunity and, 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 you know, ability to be in place, we can't just sort of point to the shiny new thing and say the new thing being built means we did planning right, right? Because it is about structures, it is about narrative, it is about really understanding do people have the opportunity to stay and thrive where they want to live, they, you know, that they want to live wherever they want to live. So for me, I, you know, it, 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 it's harder to do that within a political environment because we, we, we're a space of ribbon cutting. But the reality in the end is really digging deep to, to affirm for those who've lived here for a long time, the mayor said five generations or five minutes, that five minute person feel like they want to be here for five generations and their success is I have a city where my child and my great grandchildren want to thrive. So it really is focusing it from the shiny box and the jobs to really going back to do people feel like they belong and that, and that they have the opportunity to fully invest and live out their entire life here. Who's next? Ellen. Turn on your mic. <laughs> Sorry, just get so carried away. Um, it, it, rather than boil it down to one, if I could try two, um, you know, one, one is certainly to focus, as, as I mentioned before, on making all the areas of the city inclusive, including those that have not uh, welcomed lower income people. But more than that, I think uh, there, there are neighborhoods like Congress Heights that we should be focusing on intensely because it's clear that the pincers of gentrification are, are moving in that direction. And yet there's a lot of city owned land that's in that area that could be either um, turned over to some of the local organizations like Younger Sites Training and Development Organization or at least give them a piece of that pie as those pieces of land are redeveloped so that there's um, collateral built up within those organizations for them to continue to do their own projects and to con continue to have ownership in the neighborhood. And then couple that with some of the tools that uh, we had a while ago, but have been really pioneered in a big way by the 11th Street Bridge Project the home buyers uh, clubs, the community land trusts. the So we, we really need to be proactive now um, so that the, you know, planners have always been torn because when we look to quote, improve a neighborhood, um, uh, there's no stop button. So one begins to improve public facilities or whatever, but if the neighborhood then is perceived as a great neighborhood, it doesn't necessarily remain in the hands of the people who were there, who we were trying to improve the quality of life for. So we've got to use all of those extra tools like community land trusts to make it possible for uh, neighborhoods to provide improved qualities of life without eliminating the people for the original. Thanks, Ellen. Harriet, Andy. Turn your mic on, Harriet. I'll go back to a point I made earlier about transportation that like, I think everyone has said there's really no one thing because if you invest in one thing, it has an impact on the land values. Transportation is a good example, something as simple as a bike lane, much less a new transit stop. But I do think transportation is fundamental uh, for equity, that if people don't have access to their daily needs, um, and, and if we're, a, we're, right now we're a city that the uh, car ownership is not necessarily the price of entry into the economy, where it is, whereas it is everywhere else practically, uh, you know, in this country. So that's an important thing that makes it possible for people to be able to continue to stay in the district. It's not enough, uh, but it's an important thing. And we still have big inequality in terms of where people have convenient access to transportation. We need more of it. We need to invest more in it. Uh, you know, the city needs to be part of that, uh, not, just, uh, uh, not just Metro. 
but I think uh, that that's huge. And if you can have an if you can't have access to jobs or your daily needs without a car, um, then you are really behind the eight ball, and it's going to be hard to stay here. Andy, after you answer, I'm going to take a few questions from the from the uh, participants from the audience. So, Andy, go ahead. So, if there's one thing, I mean, there's so many things to say. In fact, you know, schools is huge, growth of the city is huge, healthcare is huge. If there's one thing, I guess, if you were to boil it down, I would say, Andrew put it well. He said, you know, you're about, we're changing the conversation, right? Planning has the opportunity to do that. And I would say, take the report that Andrew did and that the mayor put forward on housing equity and took an aspiration about creating an inclusive city and put analysis and numbers to it. And I think we want to do one thing to change the course of everything, make, you know, adopt that, make it happen. It's what the mayor's doing. And I think you, as you can see, planning is generational. If you, if that were to happen and that could shift the direction and the trajectory of the city, it would be a more inclusive place and you have to stick with it. So I would take that report seriously, adopt it and implement it. Okay. Um, I want to make sure that I can uh, get a few questions in. So I'm, I'm going to try and use the uh, question and answer. And um, I think, Uwe, you just want me to select a couple of questions, yeah? So um, I'm going to take maybe two at a time. And some of these questions are very long. So I got to say that the more complex the question, the less likely I am going to be to choose it. Um, so. Of the 3,000 amendments that were proposed, how many were proposed by community groups and have been submitted to the council by OP? I think this question is basically a question about the integrity of the process and the, and the carry through, the follow, the throughput. So Andrew, uh, I'd love for you to, to answer it, but anyone, everyone has had to deal with this at a certain level. Yeah, uh, so I, all, I will say um, all of the proposals uh, were sent to council uh, and they're all available on our website at plandc.dc.gov. Uh, so you can go and look through as well as um, what were incorporated and were not. So um, I, I don't have, we didn't classify by community group or not. I, I don't think we would be in a place to determine what is a community group and what is not a community group or an individual or other things. Um, I do know um, a, a good number of the amendments were related uh, to um, updating plans from other agencies, for example. Um, but I, I believe we, we, and we have the numbers, um, but a vast majority of them were either accepted or accepted with some level of revision uh, into the public review document that was put out last October. Uh, so that process, uh, while quite large uh, and maybe unpre and, and unprecedented, I'm gonna say unprecedented, nothing like it in the history of the city, uh, for marking up a document like that. Um, uh, I think we, we got a lot of really good feedback that, that, that was incorporated. But maybe I'll let, I don't know, Eric, I see you nodding. I don't know if you have any, uh, any more kind of um, depth to add to that answer. I'm just, I'm just nodding that, um, that, <laughs> that um, I, I believe there were 1,100 amendments that came from, from agencies and then 2,000 came from the community. And um, the law that work was reconciling um, sort of duplicate amendments and then really just trying to to aggregate and align um, values, intention, direction um, for its efficacy. So yeah, once again, there's a huge spreadsheet. I don't know, Andrew, if you've changed it, that listed what the recommendation was, how it related to an existing policy. So all that sh still should be on plan dc.dc.gov. Great. So I'm going to stay here for a little bit because obviously in celebrating 20 years, we also recognizing the present and the future. So another question for you, Andrew, but um, uh, the comp plan is a guiding document, not a necessarily a policy document. So that raises a question from the audience member, why was so much about changing and reviewing the zoning code removed from the mayor's plan? Um, so that's it's a good question. Let me just say, I, I, I think it's a guiding document and it guides policy. So I, it actually does have policies and actions. So I, I don't know if I would say it's not a policy document, um, but it is, it is a guiding document. 
Um, so just with that, uh, the reason is because as uh, Harriet and Ellen know, uh, there was a zoning rewrite uh, that, that was done, uh, that completed in 2016. I think it started in 1864, um, uh, but it, uh, sorry, Harriet, no, it didn't start that way. Um, no, uh, it, it, you know, a very long zoning rewrite process. Uh, and it, it did some important things. Uh, Harriet mentioned uh, ADUs, for example. Um, and so though that, that zoning rewrite was done uh, and incorporated, uh, and so that, so that this comp plan recognizes that zoning rewrite. Okay, so I'm gonna throw out a question now that everyone, all of the directors can answer, because it's, it's been a question that's been raised many times uh, in meetings I've been in and probably the, over the whole 20 years. Um, the evolving and the developed role of the advisory neighborhood commissions in that system is one of the hallmarks of the District of Columbia. There are very few cities, if any other city in the United States, that devotes an organized um, amount of influence and input on behalf of neighborhoods. And the Advisory Neighborhood Commission is a significant vehicle for that input. I'd like all of you to kind of talk about the role of the ANCs and maybe our engagement in the city as a whole around the comp plan. But the ANCs, is, do they have too much clout, too little? Are they just about right? What's your opinion about that? I don't think that the ANCs are necessarily a substitute for uh, community outreach. I don't think that uh, talking to the uh, elected members of the ANCs necessarily gets you the diversity of views that might be in a given neighborhood about the changes that are uh, that are happening. Um, and let's be honest, at different moments, not every ANC is as functional as other ANCs. Um, you know, it's uh, it's it's it, it's our little d democracy. Uh, and, and a very important thing. So many of our uh, current council members, you know, started out as ANCs. They're important institutions, but they're not, they're not everything, uh, especially when we're trying to get to people um, who haven't really been heard, whose views haven't really been heard. Um, so that's what I would say about it. Yeah. Okay, well. I would just add with regard to ANCs that um, they, they have a, a really important role to play, but uh, there's, a, there's a great difference in the, um, the knowledge of how to effectively participate and what are the, the principles and the, the, the concepts involved uh, in, the broad, in, in the broader way. Uh, and we've tried in the past, I know when I was at OP, to offer training sessions for new ANC commissioners or ANC commissioners in general. It's been hard because it, it's, it's a difficult job and it's not paid and they have other full-time activities. Uh, but the, that that is something that would be worth the city spending even more time and resources in, in trying to equip the ANCs to be more effective participants. But that does lead to a second question, which is a big one that comes up in my the class I teach in land use controls. Um, if one is making policies and or decisions about something like, for example, a building that features a large percentage of affordable housing, should the people who live within 200 feet, which is the, the zoning standard, or the ANC have all of the role in weighing into that decision or should, ha, shouldn't should we also include those people who might live there, those people who are experiencing problems of homelessness or lack of affordable housing throughout the city, don't they also have a, a role to play? Um, right now, the Office of Planning tries to represent citywide needs and goals and we do our best in zoning cases, uh, but that, that tension between a strictly local focus and representing broader city values is, uh, is a, a question that we always have to struggle with. Anybody else? Okay, so just, ask, go, ahead. Uh, go ahead, Andy, go ahead. 
No, I said a shortcoming. I would just say, reiterate a point that, you know, look, I think the ANC is a very important role to play in local participation. And obviously it's not the sole voice in a neighborhood. There are many community organizations, but I think again, back to this point about the comp plan, since this is what Sessions focused on, you know, they have also, what happens there has to occur within the context of these larger policies, right? And because you have to have the overall policies for the city, the overarching policies and what the comp plan lays out as the framework within which you're working within. And I think that's a very important balancing act between the very local decisions and the larger goals, particularly if you're going to address many of these structural issues that we're talking about. So now this question kind of follows up on that. And I remember being in many meetings with each of you in which the question of density um, came up and has always been a big bright line around planning in the district. And, you know, whether it's Ward 3 or Ward 7, I've been in so many meetings where people are like, we don't want our neighborhood character changed. Uh, we, want, uh, we want it to be just like it is, but we also want the white cloth table restaurant. Um, and other amenities. You know, the Harriet, it was you who first introduced the data that sometime before 2040, the district's population is going to reach 800,000. And um, our infrastructure is then going to need to be re examined because the original infrastructure was built for 800,000. So we reach that number and go beyond it, what, what, what's going to be needed? So I'm very interested in hearing all of you, and this will probably be uh, the last question that you weigh in on. Um, so, so just keep it real direct. What do, you, what do you think about growth, more people coming to the district, density in every ward, uh, making all neighborhoods uh, achieve greater equity in the distribution of goods? Um, and also, what does that imply as we march towards 800,000 and perhaps beyond? Um, what, what are people looking at? What are you looking at as you see comprehensive planning over the next 20 years? I think that the district has, um, you know, has some opportunities. I mean, I think one of the, the jobs of the planner, right, is to is to you know be the Wayne Gretzky, try to skate to where the puck is going to be, which is hard, uh, and and you're not always right. So uh, that projection, you know, was based on the rate of growth that the district uh, was doing, um, you know, after uh, you know coming out of the recession, uh, and we're a landlocked place. We have height limits. Um, all of those things suggest that. Um, you know, the district needs to look at those strategic opportunities, whether they're the ones that Ellen suggested on uh, publicly owned land. Uh, it's co-development with facilities like fire stations and libraries, uh, but also, uh, you know, recognizing that there's probably going to be a new normal uh, in our downtown with, uh, uh, you know, with uh, more people working from home going into the future. That means that maybe it's a uh, It'll be more feasible to convert some current office uses to housing. Um, and I think there are places where density can easily be absorbed without uh, much consequence. Uh, Lord and Taylor is closing and Neiman Marcus has filed for bankruptcy. I mean, there are, there's that, that section of, of, uh, of Friendship Heights that, um, you know, that is well served by transit that, that has dense development across Western. I mean, there are places where it makes sense to try to accommodate, uh, you know, much higher density. But I also think density is an abstraction, um, and that and that density can be managed by design to look a lot of different ways. Uh, people are right to be concerned about some of the impacts, but those are the things that people might think should be talking about. What are the impacts? Not let's not have any change in my neighborhood because we do have to change to accommodate, you know, the changing needs of the city and and our priorities to. Uh, uh, particularly to increase fairness and opportunity for people who haven't had it. I saw you had not. You know, and, and the, to echo on that, Don, that like density isn't a whole bunch of 400 square foot studios stacked on top of each other. And I think that we sort of sowed that typology that it really is, is, is it, it's a density of activities. It creates a critical mass for economic opportunity, economic justice. It creates a critical mass for us to be able to have access to and, you know, fully benefit from 
from our transportation systems. And so I think at some point we need to sort of shift this conversation less from this sort of height, which we tried to do in the framework. It's height and density are not the same, um, but also what, what's the, the intensity and activity that it creates and the opportunity that it creates in terms of, of, of jobs and access and, 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 and what that sort of density dividend, um, how it in some ways minimizes some of the displacement pressures and other things. We have to have this conversation be more because I think people point to one typology. I lived on U Street and go, that's density, but that's just height in some instances or things closer together and not really what does activity generate and what does the opportunity generate um, for the district as a whole. Helen, Andy. Um, I think we got to where we are now, um, the recovery that we've seen that has allowed us to provide almost universal health care, almost universal three, pre-K, three, four, uh, brand new schools and libraries throughout the city. We got there because we invested. Um, we invested in infrastructure and in uh, economic development, in economic generating uh, activities. And I, so I think we, I, I think we are about to enter a pretty rough few years get when the full impact of the lack of economic activity due to COVID hits. Um, but even if we're in lean years, I think we need to continue to invest in things like bus lanes uh, for, uh, to, to make it easy as to get to Harriet's point, we need to make it easy for people throughout the city to get to jobs and access uh, services. Uh, and that's a, a very low cost way of, of improving that. We need to make sure as we get increased density and population that we are protecting and enhancing our parks and open space. Uh, and uh, also as Harriet observed, density isn't, uh, density and height aren't, um, they are perceived at ground level. I mean, what, what's really important is not so much how tall a building is, is how well is it designed to meet at the streets so that one has a sense of vitality and liveliness, even as one is walking along the, uh, the pavements. So I think that uh, the most, and, and last of all, as we increase density, we need to think of it as profit sharing so that that extra density that the public sector awards we need to reap some of that back in terms of providing for affordable housing and other amenities for the communities in which projects are being built. Andy? Um, yeah, I agree with what everyone said. I, I, I don't think we can shy away from density. I mean, density to me is fundamental to a vibrant um, and inclusive city. I think density is very, very important to, we want successful commercial corridors. You wanna create more housing supply. You wanna ge generate more revenue. You wanna meet our climate goals. Density is fundamental to that. So I think the, the discussion then is, how do you do density in a sensitive way? And I think Eric and Ellen and Harriet's, all these points are all right. What happens at the ground level? How do you design it? Um, what's the nature of density and height? But density is really fundamental to uh, you know, successful urban areas. And I think how it's done is a question, but I don't think the question is how, not if. And I think that's um, really, really uh, very, very important to really the future of the city. Okay, I'm gonna do a, a, a lightning round now. This is the last, we've got five more minutes and I want one sentence, one sentence from every director and Andrew, you're gonna get the last sentence, okay? So, um, and, and the real sentence has to do with what is your message to the folks who are listening and there's over 300 of them and I don't know how many more are gonna be listening to the streaming and the um, recording of this, but they'll be doing that probably all over the world. Um, so what's your one message, one sentence um, to the audience as a professional planner, as you look into the future of the District of Columbia through the lens of comprehensive planning? One sentence. Okay, I'll start. Okay. 
Um, I think the, the most important message is not to be afraid of change because it's going to happen. Uh, and that's, uh, and it can be change in the direction of more lively, vibrant neighborhoods, um, places like Capitol Hill and DuPont Circle that are very dense. Um, but we can't, we can't just, uh, it, it, not every change is a loss and uh, we all need to get behind making those changes be positive and creating, um, creating a more vibrant city and great neighborhoods. One sentence again, Eric. Thank you Office of Planning staff and community for making so much content and so many, bringing so many ideas that we are having a robust debate about the future of the city. Thank you, Andy. Um, I would say that take the comprehensive plan seriously. Um, and it is a foundation of how we express ourselves, our vision as a city, and that the comprehensive plan has to be a balancing of both in growth and equity. It has to be about the whole city coming together for what its future is, and it's going to be a balancing of interests but it has to reflect a strong vision and take it seriously. Thank you. And Harriet, one sentence. Um, support the amendments to the comprehensive plan to continue our movement toward a more inclusive, fair, resilient, beautiful, livable city. Okay. All right, Andrew, you get the final word on this one. Uh, I, I just think in this time of uh, maybe national political rancor and stress, um, supporting the comprehensive plan is something that you as an individual can do to help build a, a positive, equitable, vibrant future in our city. Thank you all. I'm going to uh, just say to uh, you, Andrew, and to Uva and to the panelists, thank you for letting me be a part of this conversation. I've enjoyed it a great deal. Um, I look forward to seeing everybody in the audience in person one day soon. If you haven't voted, go out and vote. Um, Uva, over to you. Thank you so much, Don. Uh, such a masterful job as always, uh, negotiating so many different issues uh, and ideas. Thank you, thank you so much. I'd also like to thank all of the speakers, all of our panelists, uh, not only for participating in this dialogue, uh, but really for the commitment and work uh, that you've expressed today. Um, a very special thank you and congratulations to both Andrew and Eric, uh, who've worked so hard on, on preparing this document and submitting uh, that's before the council right now. And, um, you know, on behalf of, of all residents of the district, you, you know, we're, we're just very excited and engaged to see where this goes. Uh, um, everyone has a stake in the future of the city. And I think the dialogue today uh, expressed that uh, very, very well. I'd like to thank everyone who's joined us today. I think this is the largest event we've ever hosted um, at the Global Cities Initiative. And if anyone is interested in our ongoing dialogue, please go to our website, globalcities.georgetown.edu, uh, sign up and you'll get uh, emails from us. Uh, we do have additional events that we're very excited about. Um, uh, in a couple of weeks, we'll be interviewing uh, famed uh, economist, uh, Jeffrey Sachs. Uh, and uh, we have this year engaged uh, a visiting fellow, Angela Glover Blackwell, very uh, accomplished and important thinker on cities uh, with whom we'll be engaging in public events uh, in the spring. So with that, uh, thank you to everyone um, and have a great day. And uh, we look forward to the next opportunity to enter into dialogue.